Well, good evening. Um, well, good evening in New York, uh, where Chris Bossy is. Good, very early good morning. Uh, it's indeed a, really a great pleasure to introduce Chris Bossy, uh, Director of the Laboratory of Visionary Architecture, or LAVA, as the acronym goes. Uh, and Chris was formerly the designer of the water cube while uh, working as uh, Associate Architect at PTW Architects. Uh, my name is Tom Barabas, Professor of, in Architecture in the School of Architecture and Design at NYIT. Uh, the format of these um, uh, Beyond the Envelope series of events is a presentation by the architect, followed by a student-led interview. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce here online Master of Architecture, final year student, Raya Girish Nerukara, uh, who will conduct this interview with Chris Bossi following his presentation. Uh, before introducing Chris, I'd like to warmly thank Dean Maria Perbellini for her support uh, for this series of presentations and interviews, uh, and also many thanks to David Diamond, Director of the Master of Architecture Program here at New York Tech, for his support uh, uh, for launching a third series of this uh, MR graduate seminar course, Beyond the Envelope. This series of presentations and interviews uh, could really never be launched without the important contribution uh, and hard work of our lectures and events committee, especially committee chair uh, Athena Papadopoulou and the invaluable administrative support of student Susan Sternberg. Chris Bossi founded LAVA in 2007 with Tobias Valliser and Alexander Reek. This international network of leading architects uses the latest research and technology to build efficient, sustainable and beautiful structures. Educated in Germany and Switzerland, Bossi bases his work on the computerized study of organic structures and resulting spatial conceptions. His award-winning design projects have won Bossi an international reputation as a new generation architect who pushes the boundaries of traditional structure and architecture by digital and experimental form finding. As associate architect at PTW in Sydney, Bossi was a key designer of the Beijing Olympic uh, water cube winner of the Atmosphere Award at the 99th uh, Venice Architecture Biennale and the AIA Jorn Utzen Award for International Architecture. The following year, uh, Bossi received the Emerging Architect RIVA Award um, in 2012 Perspectives 40 Under 40 for Asia's Rising Design Stars and an Australian Design Honor in 2015. LAVA was the 2016 Laureate for European Center uh, for Architecture, Art and Design, and Urban Studies at the Chicago Anitheum, um, Museum of Architecture and Design. Uh, honestly, the list of further awards is just so long uh, to read out uh, this evening. Um, trust me, it's a, it's a long list of awards, really quite, quite achieved. Uh, so alongside um, his architectural practice, Bossy is adjunct professor at the University of Technology, Sydney, uh, and he lectures worldwide and here tonight as well. The project in focus in this evening's presentation and interviews PTW's project for the National Aquatic Center, also known as the Water Cube, uh, completed for the Beijing Olympics in, two, in 2008. In his presentation titled Digital Cathedrals, Man, Technology and Nature, Synergy in the Inver in Urban Environment, Chris Fossey will present a building wrapped in bubble membranes as a case study into the Water Cube Swimming Center designed for the 2008 Olympics in Beijing. In reflecting on this building, Chris asks these questions. How did geometries in nature create both efficiency and beauty? What can architecture learn from nature in the areas of structure, material, and building skin? How are efficient, intelligent, and beautiful membranes for interiors and exteriors a solution for the future? Chris Bossi was a key team member, uh, key design team member, whilst uh, associate architect at PTW, and he conceived the bubble concept. Um, the water cube associates water as a structural and thematic light motif with the square, the primal shape of the house in Chinese tradition and mythology. The entire structure of the water cube is based on a unique lightweight construction developed by PTW and CSCEC with Arab and derived from the structure of water in the state of aggregation of foam. Behind the totally randomized appearance hides a strict geometry that can be found in natural systems like crystals, cells, and molecular structures. 
By applying this material and technology, the transparency and apparent randomness is transposed into the inner and outer skins of ETFE cushions. Unlike traditional stadium structures with their gigantic columns and beams, cables and backspans, to which a facade system is applied, the architectural space, structure, and facade are one and the same element. Along with Herzog Demeron's Bird's Nest Stadium, the water cube has become synonymous with the Beijing Olympics and a symbol of the city. Join me, please, to welcome to New York Tech, Crix Bossi, Director of the Laboratory of Visionary Architecture, LAVA. Thank you so much, Tom and Susan and Needy and everybody uh, online for having me. It's a great privilege. It's 5 a.m. here in Ho Chi Minh City and 35 degrees. You will possibly see the sunrise behind me at some stage of this lecture, uh, depending how many slides I have. <laughs> uh, thank you for the great introduction that takes me back <clears throat> all the way to 2003 um, when, when we wrote this text about the light motif and about stadia who traditionally have um, these big spans and are all about kind of the, the power of engineering and showing all the forces in large structures and how we kind of try to conceive a new uh, paradigm or a new typology for these type of buildings. So um, you introduced Lava uh, briefly. Um, these are my partners, Tobias Walliser and Alexander Rieck. We won't have much time today to talk about Lava work, I think. I will focus on the Aquatic Center, but maybe in the question answers later, we can show some current work as well. Um, the one thing that we have kind of kept um, in our minds and in our hearts is this inspiration from nature um, combined with technology. So all the buildings, all the master plans, all the interiors uh, in our work, you can always trace back to some kind of natural phenomena and uh, some application of new construction technologies or communication uh, technologies or material science. And we always try to create places for people of the 21st century. And with that, um, I will present this uh, literally as a kind of a throwback to 2003 presentation, <clears throat> um, where in 2003, we collaborated with a very large amount of international people from uh, various cultures and countries. Um, to do this competition for the National Swimming Center in uh, Beijing. So you can see me here on the bottom left uh, as a young man, 32 years of age. And next to me, Mark Butler, who was the um, senior architect at PDW Architects, uh, very experienced with sports uh, buildings. And uh, next to him, an entire team from CCDI, um, a Chinese um, at the time, um, what we call LDI, Local Design Institute, um, which is a whole story in itself, how China over the last 20 years kind of came uh, out of its past and into this kind of new high-speed capitalism where all of a sudden architecture firms were growing. And this particular architecture firm grew from 15 people when we met them in 2003 to 4,000 uh, people in 2015 when I last checked. Um, where uh, all other architecture firms around the world have stayed the same size. So the story of the building is also a story of China and of its people. Um, and the, the kind of thought process um, goes back to this idea where as a student and a recent graduate, I was sort of wondering why do all these buildings around the world look the same? Essentially, architecture seemed to be like diminished to this art of cladding some efficient box with some glass facade, which may or may not look good, but it doesn't didn't seem to have any relationship to space um, or to any type of structure or any type of typology. And when you look back at kind of the ancient cathedrals, um, which are highly kind of decorative at the same time, ornamental and incredibly spatially interesting, then you find that all structural elements at the same time have um, an ornamental, decorative, and spatial function. So rather than just being a box, being clad in something. 
And um, when I studied, I studied um, at the Institute of Lightweight Structures in Stuttgart, where Fry Otto at the time was the, uh, the founder of the Institute. And that Institute has heavily influenced all students around Stuttgart, this discipline of mixing disciplines of engineering and architecture and finding shapes and forms and structures in nature. So this idea of so bubbles and spider webs and branching structures and so on was always prevalent and being taught in Stuttgart. And so um, this project, which precedes the water cube was for a tower based on this idea of circle packing uh, or bubble packing. And this idea that if you create a three-dimensional network of structural relationships, then you would get a, a much more stable, but also more interesting and better looking structure than just putting sticks and slabs on top of each other. So the result was this tower, which we call the bubble high rise. And it was this highly um, expressive ornamental, um, yet very structurally efficient high rise tower in Berlin. And at the time we collaborated with Arup in London with Charles Walker and his team um, of the advanced geometry unit. Cecil Belmont was leading that unit. So it was around that time in uh, 2002 where a lot of these projects started emerging, including the Serpentine Pavilion by Toyo Ito, which you may remember, which is kind of this weird and wonderful triangulated um, kind of space frame. So the project, of course, didn't go anywhere being in Berlin and was replaced um, with a kind of normal high rise tower with sticks and slabs and a glass facade. But uh, this idea was born that structure, ornament and space should become much more in architecture. Um, I mentioned Fry Otto and his uh, soap bubble experiment. So the most famous one is the Munich Olympic Stadium in 1972, which is also uh, the year I was born. So this is now more than 50 years old, but one of the most modern looking structures, I think in Germany or maybe in the world, um, this lightweight roof derived by the forces within soap films that gently kind of hovers over a landscape. So it's not really a roof, the roof becomes a landscape in itself. And uh, Fry Otto wrote an entire book about soap bubbles and structures and uh, possibilities and all that. Uh, I had in my baggage when I arrived in Sydney in 2002 in October. And in Sydney, I joined this big architecture company called PTW, was uh, mentioned by Tom. And um, they're an architecture firm that has been around since I think 1880. And half of the buildings that you see on this picture, except the opera house are designed and built by them. So it's one of these large practices. Um, of rather commercial nature, but have done some very good work and um, they're very experienced. And so somehow they managed to get onto this competition for the Aquatic Center in Beijing on the shortlist due to their experience with the Sydney Olympics where they um, designed several structures. And um, the, the master plan for the uh, Olympic Green um, kind of saw two buildings at the entrance of the Olympic Boulevard, um, the main stadium and the aquatic center. And I'll go through this a little bit quicker. Um, when we started the competition, the main stadium design had just been released and the main stadium was designed by Herzog Dumeron and was this round um, red structure called the bird nest. It was this very expressive kind of large, sculptural object and uh, to put a swimming center next to it was kind of the task of really responding almost to an existing condition and uh, our one of our award winning or competition winning moves was rather than trying to compete with the main stadium by building something even greater more extravagant bigger more expressive next to it we decided to respond with the opposite um, and create kind of a pair of buildings. And when the stadium kind of represented fire and uh, energy, we came up with this idea of water and uh, this kind of yin as opposed to yang and the kind of more poetic 
uh, structure in response, which we also based on this idea of Chinese traditional dwellings, which are square. And there's a whole philosophy um, about um, humankind in the center of the universe. The forbidden city is a square. The temple of heaven is a square with circular base and so on. So there's a long tradition in Chinese philosophy and architecture about circle and square. And uh, that led us to essentially suggesting a blue box network next to a red circle. And that won us the competition against uh, Norman Foster and Shin Takamatsu and Dominic Perrault and, and the rest of the world's like really big designers at the time. Um, then coming back to this idea of uh, Fry Otto and looking at nature under the microscope, coral structures, bone structures, um, kind of polymeric foam under the microscope and so on. We kind of uh, investigated further what that could mean for the blue box. So one uh, fellow um, competitor at the time said, oh, what the hell, it's a blue box. Um, but it wasn't just a blue box. It was a blue box full of surprises. And the more kind of layers you peel away, the more you would discover. So we had these uh, ideas that the box represented water and bubbles with uh, ultimately kind of uh, bubbles rising from the building. We looked into this geometry of foam in a three-dimensional manner and um, as a structural and as a facade motif. And we came up with this kind of early Photoshop um, representations of what that could be. And I still do this today where people say um, it's it's not a rendering as such, it's sort of a sketch. It's like a three-dimensional montage of what I envisaged the building to be. So I montage this foam together with activity, with light coming through. You can see a goldfish in the back uh, projected onto it and uh, the pool in the foreground. So that's kind of a way of coming up with spatial and atmospheric ideas for buildings by collaging them. Um, and we then discovered together with our engineering partners from Arup that there's um, these geometries in foam that you can actually uh, verify and quantify and model. And uh, this is a long story of the Kelvin foam, which dates back to 1873. Um, and then a more recent foam model by two Irish professors, Professor Weir and Phelan. Um, who found that if you combine two different polygons, 12-sided and 14-sided with each other, then you create an infinite array of three-dimensional packaging, which you can then quantify in a computer model and essentially associate every single um, element, every edge of this foam with a structural element. And so that led to uh, this journey of packaging foam that infinitely grows and then slicing it into a cube. And by doing so, deriving a facade and um, deriving a geometry for the structure. If you can see this, this is a, a quick video of how this was derived. At the time, um, Discovery Channel was taking a keen interest and there's multiple features on National Geographic and so on about this relationship between nature and the structure and the resulting building. So the result was um, a structure that was super lightweight, super efficient, uh, and super strong and looked completely natural, although it was completely man-made. This was our first 3D virtual prototyping corner of the building, which was sort of the proof of concept that this doesn't only exist in the computer, but you can take it out into the real world. And in total, um, it became a structure of 22,000 beams, 12,000 nodes, 180 by 180 meter in uh, dimension and 35 meter high. And then once you start uh, discovering these kind of concepts of nature and patterns, you, you find this pattern everywhere you look. So I looked at uh, the nose of my dog at the time, Nero, and found that even his nose has the same kind of uh, Voronoi three-dimensional bubble pattern on him. So it's a prevalent pattern in nature that is constantly reoccurring. Um, the idea then was to wrap this lightweight, efficient structure, three-dimensional kind of space frame into a lightweight skin 
with the material that now is probably very common, but at the time was quite new, called ETFE, which is kind of uh, a lightweight inflatable um, Teflon derivative that comes from the space industry. And that allowed us to let light into the building and trap energy between two layers of structure uh, and protect the steel from corrosion and from the elements and at the same time um, create this transparency and um, this kind of surreal underwater look. So the building became wrapped in a lightweight skin and acting like a greenhouse, which means you could save a lot of energy. So you don't need heating, for example, in winter necessarily for the pool. And um, in a swimming pool, you have quite sort of adverse conditions because on the inside you have chlorinated water, you have high temperature, high humidity. And in Beijing, you may have 40 degrees outside in summer and minus 20 degrees outside in winter. So here's an example of this film, which is um, clamped between um, kind of facade mullions and then inflated. Um, some images from the competition, I'll, I'll jump a little bit ahead with that. But sort of this was uh, our vision. So the building wrapped in lightweight skin with the structure shining through. And we had this idea of this goldfish kind of inhabiting the bubble box, uh, kind of like a permanent visitor. And then from the um, sophisticated 3D model of the 22,000 pieces onto a model shop where um, people had to essentially create this as a physical model. And that was, for me, a physical model is always the first test of a building. If you can't build a physical model, then you will have a very hard time to build the actual real thing. But because of the repetitiveness um, of the structure, there's only, I think, 16 different um, shapes that then repeat within the structure and within the cladding. Um, it was um, relatively easy to build these molds and, and repeat them. And that became a whole industry of water cube models in China. This is the first one, but since then, there has been one built for every mayor's office throughout the province and for all the Olympic facilities and so on and so forth. Um, some atmospheric studies about lighting and sparkling and so on. So this idea of the lightweight film, of course, was that the structure is always visible and it doesn't just become a cladding from the outside with a nondescript facade, but there's always this relationship between what it looks like and how it works and what's on the inside. And Tom mentioned in 2004, to our great surprise, we won the uh, Golden Lion, the Atmosphere Award at the Venice Biennale which was a great kind of boost for the project because all of a sudden it had international recognition and all of a sudden people realized that there was something really special about it going on. And this, if you can see that, is the uh, competition video. Um, and this whole idea of renderings in video, by the way, in 2002, 2003, wasn't very common. So this is sort of, for me, the first time that there's a whole professional industry providing visualizations and providing animations for competitions and for projects, which is now very common. And I'm sure you're teaching that at university and every student can now do similar things. Because it's also a building that you can't necessarily just describe in plans and sections and elevations. So it's really a three-dimensional structure and it's all about the experience. With the interest uh, of time, I'll move a little bit faster into construction. So the big day came after we won the competition. Um, within six months, they started construction. This is on Christmas Day, 2003. And they had thousands of construction workers turning up on site, digging a giant hole, 200 by 200 meter. And we started getting into the detail of things, um, building prototypes for the ETFE, doing lighting tests. <clears throat> this is a prototype actually at scale one to two. So the actual bubbles are twice the size. The biggest bubble is nine meters in diameter. And um, the advantage of this material under inflation is that it doesn't need any substructure. So you can span nine meters without any columns and beams and any other structure underneath. And the material um, could be layered. So you can have multiple layers 
with different properties um, with this um, silver dots printed onto them to prevent overheating of the building, but at the same time still keeping the transparency. Then these steel pieces that were manufactured from our 3D model, um, 22,000 steel pieces individually cut and um, delivered on site and all corresponding to these repetitive nodes. And while the geometry was repetitive, the thickness of the steel and the dimension of the beam was different, which contributed to this effect of randomness because you had very thin uh, kind of sticks and very thick sticks that each corresponded to the load that they actually carried. Maybe that's another good point to make in a in a traditional kind of engineering solution, you would always go for the worst case scenario and size all the steel members according to the worst load case. In this case, every steel member was attributed only the load that it actually carries. Then the construction went on and I was always quite fascinated that there was this big discrepancy between the super digital 3D model and Arab engineers and so on. And then some guy on site with a drawing trying to work out where these steel elements go. So it was kind of this mix between high tech and low tech, him ticking off here, which node has been built and hasn't been built. And, uh, you know, with the wheelbarrow kind of bringing the nodes in. But it was extremely fascinating how they actually did that. They built the entire structure as a scaffold first and uh, the legend has it that the scaffold was heavier and more expensive than the actual steel structure and we did the first cladding tests still with the scaffold on to achieve this in the end and you could start uh, appreciating the overall size and so on and then one fine day the scaffold came off the structure was visible in its full glory and uh, for the first time, you could really appreciate this effect of three-dimensionality of space frame and uh, bubble structure. So you can see the roof and the walls um, do all the hard work. And then the facades are only, only four meters thick in diameter. And then moving through to closer to completion, the facade went on and you could kind of appreciate the light filtering through and the structure shining through in the back. And you could see this relationship between the stadium being built at the same time um, of this quite dominant um, kind of typology and the aquatic center much more sort of filigree and lightweight, but together really building a pair of buildings and uh, having kind of a contrast and harmony with each other. Some pictures of the finished uh, facade and what's beautiful about it, uh, uh, that it reflects the light during the day in different ways. So sometimes it becomes transparent, sometimes it becomes silver. Most people, when they look at it, think it's an aluminum facade of some sort, but then it's curvy, so it really can't be. Then it's transparent. So it's sort of mysterious. Sometimes it looks completely um, plastic, three-dimensional, voluptuous, and sometimes it looks flat. Um, it reflects the sky and uh, changes during, during the course of the day. And we choose, uh, chose a slightly blue tint um, to, to have this permanent impression of a blue box, despite the kind of sometimes overcast gray sky. And it actually always has this baby blue ocean-like tint to it. Yeah, lots of pictures here. I'll, I'll go closer to, to the finished result. So one fine day, the last um, ceiling panel was installed and I um, came down from my apartment to grab the newspaper and every single newspaper had the water cube on the cover. And so you can imagine with a population of 1.2 billion people, every single person on that one day um, found out about the water cube and how the water cube was finished. And it became sort of this national icon. I mean, it became famous in the architecture world, in all these different magazines and websites. Um, but it really became this icon also for the people of Beijing. And for us, it was always this idea of creating a new typology 
of its time with materials that have never been used in this context, geometries that have never been used, and somehow representing the state of architecture and, and humanity and uh, technology at that point of time. And I, I find that an important statement because that's really all you can do as an architect. So as architect, we are not trying to recreate, I don't know, 1920s Art Deco in, uh, in Sydney or in New York. Uh, we're not trying to do Victorian architecture or French architecture. We're always trying to do the architecture that is possible now with the materials and the technologies available now, obviously under the circumstances now. And this is also, remember, this was designed 20 years ago. So now uh, when you look at contemporary architecture discussion, there's a lot more discussion about uh, CLT, about bamboo structures, about community built designs and so on, which expresses more kind of the contemporary thinking around architecture. Um, and, and this to an extent, it's sort of timeless, but at the same time, uh, as an architecture historian, I think you can very much pin this to 2003, 2004, to the emergence of three-dimensional um, computer-generated or assisted uh, algorithmic design, uh, the emergence of, of these kind of techniques of representation and form generation and construction. And uh, we were very proud and still are that between the 2003 rendering and the 2008 handover of the building, we managed to completely um, translate this idea without too many losses. Um, and that is down to the fact that we essentially did a virtual prototype from the beginning. So this was probably also one of the first times that the building was completely built in what you would now call BIM, um, where all the services are coordinated, all the structure is coordinated, fire, lighting, everything is already in the original model. And so there's no surprises on the way where all of a sudden someone says, ah, oh, that's great, but we need a column grid every three meter, or we need a glass roof, and so on. All these things have been attempted, by the way, by, um, by um, how do you call that, uh, value engineering <clears throat> efforts. But uh, the interesting thing was that every time someone tried to value engineer the building and, for example, put a glass roof on, then it became heavier inefficient and twice as expensive because as soon as you put a glass roof on all of a sudden um, the weight increases then the substructure increases then the primary structure increases and all of a sudden the whole thing doesn't work so this was really an integration um, of structure facade cladding space and ornament into one and you can see that even the roof uh, 180 by 180 meter flat roof with inflatable plastic bubbles um, as a hydrophonic uh, drainage system where the water is sucked off the building. And when it snows, and it does snow, then it has 40 centimeters snow sitting on top of the building. It's quite a sight as well. Um, and maybe just a few uh, last slides. So the two buildings that became the icon and uh, this very grainy image, but the um, very much the first idea, the yin and yang, fire and water, circle and square, red and blue, was really carried through the entire design and, uh, and was exactly translated like that and perceived like that. Um, I mentioned the building became famous in architecture circles and other circles, so many books have been written. Um, there's a whole industry that has um, developed out of these patterns. So this is within the water cube. You can get fully uh, geared up with swimsuits and hoodies and um, Swarovski special edition water cubes, the water cube telephone, um, ceramic in water cube pattern. Um, you can buy tiles for your bathroom at home. So it became really bigger than us and than itself. And uh, I went with Tom to Macau for a conference and there was this building which was an exact replica of the water cube uh, as a casino. So in the great tradition of casinos and the shapes of pyramids or the Eiffel Tower, now there's a casino in the shape of the water cube Beijing. The inside <clears throat> after the Olympics was converted into a public leisure pool, um, partially. 
and another part has now been converted uh, for the Winter Olympics into ice rings and other things. Uh, both buildings, the bird nest and the aquatic center, are regularly used for things like Formula One. So they are still on the news, still on TV all the time. And uh, yeah, lighting I didn't touch on much, but the fact that you could change all of a sudden with the emergence of um, RGB uh, LEDs, you could all of a sudden change colors in buildings um, with a simple message. So this light artist installed this installation where you could send a text message to the building, it changes colors. That's also, maybe now it's a bit dated, but that was the first time to my knowledge that this could be done. And that is something that you couldn't do with the pyramids or the Eiffel Tower. So it's something that expresses that moment in time and moment of technology. And I always find uh, fascinating the obsession of politics and architecture and the, um, uh, when was this 2014 APEC conference was held at the water cube. So you can see here Putin and a few um, good friends in there, um, Obama. Uh, and all of a sudden, all these politicians, which would usually be like on some uh, party on steps with columns and architraves, all of a sudden represent themselves in this futuristic building. And that makes them almost look like a cast from Star Trek. And maybe with these words, um, this was the image that went around the world. Michael Phelps broke something like 17 world records in this pool. And uh, the camera technology at the time had developed to a point where people were filmed from underwater. So as he was swimming, breaking the world records, he was filmed um, towards the ceiling. And where people usually say, oh, don't worry about the ceiling, nobody's ever going to look at that. All of a sudden, the ceiling became the most important design element. So with this, um, I want to conclude my lecture about the water cube, and I'm very happy to take questions. I also have a few slides uh, about current work or work over the last 10 years at LAVA, but I really wanted to focus on this project um, for this particular lecture. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Chris. This is uh, really a, an eloquent and comprehensive narrative on the design and construction uh, of the water cube in Beijing. Uh, I'll introduce um, uh, Amark final year student, uh, Raya Girish Nerekar, who's going to uh, conduct the interview with you. Thank you. Hi. Hey. Uh, my name is Ria, and I would like to thank you for your exciting and immensely informative presentation of the water cube. Uh, so the first question uh, would be, uh, facilities for the Olympic Games are often conceived as symbols of their host city and country, and they serve to represent the host city and the native nation state. Uh, the Beijing Olympics was hosted at a time 15 years ago when China had great ambitions to arrive on the world stage. The water cube is a dramatic and an, even an iconic building and in how it is instantly and easily recognized and how it had immediately become synonymous with the Beijing Olympics. As the architect, can you tell us uh, more about who was your client for this project? And please describe your client's ambitions uh, for the National Aquatic Center, and what was the remit to deliver those ambitions? In simple terms, uh, what was the brief you received from the client? The scheme for the water cube included, included public multifunction leisure, fitness facilities for use. Sure, but uh, yeah, but could, could yes. we... Let, let's let's let Chris answer okay. this question. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, there's uh, quite a few questions in one. So, um, very, very well observed how um, the purpose of the Olympics is always to put, to somehow to mark, mark a moment in history, I think. And it's always an opportunity for a country um, or a city to, to make changes. And when you think, for example, about Barcelona, Barcelona is the first Olympics that I sort of became aware of. And was this transformation of this kind of little bit derelict kind of port uh, industrial city into this amazing vibrant tourist hub and the whole waterfront was cleaned up, the beaches were made uh, accessible to the people and the harbor all of a sudden became a destination and so on. And um, in Beijing, the years 
leading up to 2008, I mean, I, I sort of first went to China in 2003, and those five years for me were the absolute defining moments um, of the rise of China and transition um, into kind of a market uh, economy. Um, so, and you could see that literally like on a daily basis, the first day I arrived, you couldn't get a coffee. The last day you couldn't go to get away from Starbucks for lack of a better example, you know? The, so that was really the, the transition. And uh, if you go to Beijing now, um, which I haven't been for three or four years, but it's full of um, Western technology, cars, status symbols. And, you know, it's in a way, it's more capitalist uh, than New York. It's much more showy, you know, in, in New York, uh, maybe um, you don't show off your pink Ferrari necessarily because it's kind of, you're a bit more understated, but in China you do. <laughs> and... Um, so these are kind of just the, the superficial signs maybe, but it was definitely uh, was this big transition into, into a new economy. And um, maybe examples like this architecture firm that grew from 15 people to 4,000 people at the same time where we were completely stagnant in, in our growth is a good example, right? So it's, it was the rise and rise and rise of China and the message to the world is that China is on the world stage. China uses international consultants, international technologies, and actually exceeds international standards of sustainability, uh, of construction methods, of uh, yeah, of of all kind of associated disciplines. And and the ETFE, for example, was was a good. Uh, example where it was a technology the facade um, wrapping material a technology that wasn't available at the time in china and the chinese approach was always to have these joint venture um, collaborations so to open an etfe factory together with a german factory for example and then start the production of etfe in china so now etfe is a product available in china um, with German technology and Chinese production. So there's a lot of this kind of technology transfer that happened during that period in design, architecture, construction, uh, materials, and so on, which I saw as a really positive thing and still think. So we really helped kind of develop China into the 21st century. Um, and, and you can see China now being uh, one of the you know, biggest countries and most developed countries in the world, where now we're at a point where we can learn from their technologies, where they, you know, um, developing from smartphones to to communication to everything uh, at a at a rapid pace. Sorry, that went a little bit beyond your question, but I hope it answered some. <laughs> yeah. Who was uh, my client? Was the question right? Who was our client? So it was the um, the Olympics is a whole. I don't want to say circus, but it's a it's a global um, organization, um, and uh, the different cities have to apply to host the Olympics, and then they form an Olympic committee. So our client was the Beijing uh, Olympic Organizing Committee, uh, and then they ran competitions uh, with local and international architects and local international juries. My understanding is that. Uh, Ram Kolhas was on the jury for our building, but that was never really confirmed. And I think Herzog de Meron were also on the jury. I don't know if that's a myth or not. <clears throat> um, but it was it was selected by the jury. It was selected by the Olympic Committee and sort of the chairman um, of the city. And uh, the point I'm going to make is there's nothing better for an architect than um, a competition that you win with the deadline for the building to be completed. Because so many times you do projects and they kind of end up somewhere, nobody really knows. But if you have a deadline like the Olympics, nobody can bail out of it. They had to build this, they had to deliver on the promise. The design was set. Every time someone said, oh, wouldn't it be cheaper to build a white box and just paint the bubbles on the facade? They said, yeah, it would be cheaper. But uh, this is the project that won and has to be delivered, and you better move on. 
Okay, thank you. The second uh, question would be, the scheme for the water cube included pub public multifunction leisure and fitness facilities uh, for use by public uh, before the games and after the games. One of the risks of hosting the Olympic Games is the possibility of the underuse or possible disuse of the facilities after the two week sporting event. The term white elephant is often used to describe this condition. Can you share with us whether your project brief was to mitigate the water cube becoming a white elephant? Was this risk communicated as a concern by your client? In other words, were you given the brief to make the project accessible as public recreational infrastructure before and after the Olympic Games? Or was this proposal for buildings used by public PTW had made by your client? Mm. Now, it's interesting that uh, it's interesting that you mentioned that. And it's true for most, um, most Olympic precincts even in the world that there's always this risk that they get abandoned and unused and underutilized. And mm -hmm. it is madness, you know, to build an entire stadium just for one guy to run 100 meters in 9.2 seconds and then uh, leave the stadium behind. Mm -hmm. In China, interestingly, because the population is so big, um, the Olympic Park, every time I go there, is packed with people. There's markets, there's festivals, <clears throat> there's um, some sort of music shows or ballet or something at the stadium. And there's always something at the water cube. So the people have really embraced the building and it's become like one of the, apparently again, urban myth, the water cube is the second biggest tourist attraction after the great wall. Mm -hmm. So every Chinese person in his life has to climb onto the great wall and see the water cube. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and so, so um, it's not a white elephant as such. But what we did in order to prevent that as well was with the multifunctional um, internal layout, that it has tennis courts, that it has gyms, that it has leisure pools. So one third of the building is a leisure pool mm -hmm. that you can go with your family, buy a ticket for $10 or what it is, and spend the day in the leisure pool. So there was always this public interface. And uh, it has since been refurbished multiple times um, after the Olympics some of the seating gets reduced from uh, 17,000 seats, I think, to 6,000 seats. And so then the additional space was tra transformed into commercial facilities, into restaurants and shops. Um, and then during the Winter Olympics, it was transformed into ice curling and Winter Olympic sports. Okay. So I think there's this ongoing legacy and, uh, and people really, I think the 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 best way to to guarantee the survival of your building is to make it that special that people really look after it i think people really love this building and they will refurbish it as many times as it's needed and mm -hmm. and always find a purpose for it uh thirdly a third question would be uh what were you surprised by the transformation or adaption of the water cube as the ice cube as the venue hosting ice based spectator sports in the Beijing 2002 Olympics. Uh, did you ever anticipate that the building could be adapted in this way? Yeah, I think we, we anticipated it. I mean, we didn't know that Beijing was going to get the Winter Olympics, but this idea of multifunctionality was always there. And I actually didn't go and see it as the Winter Olympics, uh, but from what I've seen, it, it worked out really well. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a multi-purpose sport venue, and the difference between winter and summer Olympics is that uh, the water in summer Olympics is liquid, and in winter Olympics it's frozen. It's not yeah. quite like that, but essentially mm -hmm. you build an ice curling surface on top of the pool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's an important consideration, and and many stadiums around the world have have suffered the fate of being abandoned and neglected. Mm. Also has to do with budgets, of course. If you have Olympics in a country that can't sustain a long-term kind of activation um, of, of the stadiums, it's a problem. But um, yeah, I think now the Olympic Committee is much more careful um, in their briefing around these topics as well. So a lot of stadia are dismantled and recyclable and upcyclable um, sometimes dismantled and donated to other countries or other cities and so on. 
because it doesn't always make sense in every city to have like 12 stadia in one precinct. It's another mm. strategy, by the way, where Olympics are increasingly across multiple cities and multiple states. So the entire country gets an uplift rather than one city. Mm. Sydney, for example, is an example where the, the Olympics were in 2000. In 2000 um, and for, I want to say for 15 years, Homebush, the Olympic uh, city was pretty desolate uh, unless you have a Guns N' Roses concert or a soccer match. Um, but they started to redensify the whole precinct with residential and commercial facilities. And now it becomes, after 20 years, finally becomes a bit of an active suburb. But it is a bit like that. You have a concert, Guns N' Roses, 80,000 people come in. 90 minutes later, they're all gone again. There's mm -hmm. always at risk. Uh, the water cube is activated for use as a venue for competitive water sports, as well as public recreation of series of swimming pools. The building expresses the structure of water and the aesthetics of foam and, and effervescence as a basis for communicating its programming and content. Does the water cube and also the ice cube deliver the ex expectation that a building should express what activates its houses and what uses it is intended for and who the building serves? Asked in simple terms, can you please comment on the status of the Western notion of the metaphor as well as Chinese mythology as tools with which to communicate the content and meaning of architecture? Yeah, well, so you've done your homework for sure. <laughs> um, this is sort of for other people to judge. So that's what we try to do. I hope it does that. Uh, I'm still surprised how um, famous the building has become, really to a point where any dinner party, any country in the world, if someone mentions the water cube in Beijing, people have sort of an image of that. Yeah. So that's really the power of imagery and the power of architecture. Um, does it look like an aquatic center? I don't know. I mean, the, you know, there were other ideas where it's like, ah, oh, it's an aquatic center. It needs to be a wave or something like that. Mm. Uh, we try to not go for the obvious sort of ideas, but more like water as a, what I call this light motif is this German word uh, for, for like a guiding motif. Um, and, and this sort of Pandora's box, the more layers you peel, the more you discover, but it's not necessarily obvious. Okay. I think that was, you know, it was one of the first or one of the few buildings that has this sort of layering and a good building should have these layers. So it's not just something you look at it, it's like, oh yeah, that's it. I don't even need to go in. This is like, it draws you in. You want to discover, you want to be between the facade and the structure. You want to climb into the roof. You want to really move through and, and understand it. And once you've seen it, you have to come back at night because at night all of a sudden lights up and becomes a completely different thing altogether again. And as for the Chinese uh, storytelling, um, I'm I'm usually a little bit careful with this sort of cultural uh, appropriation of what you want to call it. You know, it's it's also a metaphor, but it was very strongly embraced by. By our Chinese team members, actually, they came up with this idea of circle and square and, and the square as kind of the center of humankind and the universe and so on. So there's a very strong link, uh, which has to do with like yin and yang and feng shui and so on, which in the Western world, we only now kind of slowly start to embrace. Okay, thank you. Uh, the water cube is an exemplary building in terms of its ecological performance, applying a various advanced technologies of the early 2000s. The ETSE double skin is insulating, uh, maximizes natural light, and reduces the need for artificial lighting. It captures solar energy to heat the internal spaces and harvests, recycles, and filters rainwater. With respect to reducing energy use and minimizing the burden of the water of the water cube on the water infrastructure of Beijing. Were these ecological building systems part of your brief or did you as the architect push for an expanded responsibility of this building to endorse the mitigation of climate change through better performing architecture? Yeah, also a very good question. Um, it was part of the Olympic agenda to have this green city, clean city, 
Um, and uh, I think in China, it was one of the first kind of buildings where this was even a consideration, you know. China at the time was more about building bigger, better, faster, more, and not about saving energy or materials and so on. But as soon as it was completed, it became this sort of role model. And the uh, president at the time uh, said, he literally said that Watercube is a role model for China to become like a greener, friendlier um, country with better air quality, better water quality, and kind of open to the world. This is no exact quote, but something along those lines. And um, what I mentioned earlier about politics and architecture, you know, traditionally architecture has been used in politics to demonstrate power with like columns, and architraves, and these sort of strong Pantheon style buildings. And mm -hmm. it's interesting that that politics embraces architecture actually as a message about sustainability, technology, being smart, being nimble, and and being open, being transparent as well, I think is a strong mm -hmm. symbol. Right. Uh, when you were designing this project, did you conceive it as a prototype for ecologically sound public recreation and social infrastructure? Yeah, all of that. I mean, um, a, a question was always like, can this be repeated? Right. And uh, it's not a model as such where you can say this is exactly how every building has to look like. but. Um, every building could be approached in a similar way. So we have never done an ETFE building again, and we have never used bubble structure again, okay. um, but we've always tried to use these sort of principles. Okay. Uh, our next question concerns the relationship of mathematics and the form found in nature to architectural, architectural culture. The natural formation of soap bubbles has been a fascination of architects for some time. Perhaps most noteworthy is Frey Otto's research on minimal surfaces ob observed on soap film bubbles. Although the envelope uh, components of the water cube are highly repetitive and buildable, they appear to be organic, non-uniform, and random. Although the water cube was on one of the only few built projects applying the mathematical model of the 3D Vernoy diagram, perhaps shorthand for more broadly defined three-dimensional polyhedral packing system. The spatial model of Voronoi packing and other cellular or packing diagrammatic systems was deeply embedded in the architectural cultures of the 1990s and the 2000s. Did you anticipate the impact of the design of the water cube and its use of 3D polyhedral packing upon a generation of architectural students? Well, I think I was sort of... So no, I didn't anticipate uh -huh. it. Um, I think the i was sort of touching on this only a little bit so at the time there was toyo ito there was cecil belmont um yeah. there was uh, herzog dimeron with the bird nest and herzog dimeron when you think about they spent like decades talking about ornaments and printing like uh ricola leaves on facades and things but then they moved into three-dimensionality and structure and ornament and structural expression and um, OMA with the uh, CCTV tower mm. um, also had all of a sudden breaking up, you know, traditional structures into a more expressive three-dimensional continuous loop structure and so on. So it was kind of part of this family of thinking. And that, of course, all came with the advance of computation. Um, because previously... To, to design the water cube, maybe you could have manually calculated it somehow. You have 22,000 steel pieces, mm -hmm. but every change within the design would have required six months of redrawing and recalculating mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. And so Tristram Carfrey, who was the lead engineer and one of the absolute uh, superstar driving forces behind the project, um, he set it up as a parametric model where even if at a late stage of the project, you had to add a, a fire exit on one side, the whole structure could be recalibrated within minutes and every single steel member could be calculated, uh, load capacity, length, connection, et cetera, and printed out as a plot sheet for the steel manufacturing. And so those advances in computation, they just 
facilitated a, a new generation of projects, which we now see all over the world. And sometimes um, the, the appearance is kind of uh, appropriated or, or mistaken for, for sort of pattern making. And so sometimes when someone says, ah, oh, let me do a bubble building then, or, or Voronoi building or some other interesting emergent geometry, then it, it is not necessarily about the efficiency, about the structure and about the strength or, or the principle. So it's good to kind of go back to the origins and try to think about what you actually try to achieve with that. But we now, um, we still use these principles in, in our projects, even for example, in urban planning. So when you think about urban planning and you think about a city like New York, which is based on a grid, then the grid kind of comes out of the necessity to bring some order uh, to a new kind of settlement. And so the easiest is a grid. You just say the grid is 500 by 500 meters or 250 by 250 or whatever it is. We name it A to Z and one to 10. Um, and we have a city whereby the actual movement and flow and people within the city um, act much more organically and much more fluidly. And so now we can kind of model movement and behavior of people in a much more dynamic way. And as a result, the cities that we design also aren't based on simple grids anymore. So in the past, uh, engineering, structural engineering as well as urban planning was based on this simplification like, let's try to make this really simple we have a column and a beam and that's your building and now where you have this freedom all of a sudden where you can take the forces anywhere uh, they actually flow then you come up with new kind of emergent solutions okay thank you uh the space filling system of components is Arrayed vertically on the deep double skin 3.6 uh, meter wide walls of the envelope and horizontally on the roof within a box that is partitioned and subdivided by polygons. In designing a thick double skin facade during the design stages, were there other structural systems considered in design of stages of the work? How did you determine the customization of polyhedral structure the, uh, to reduce the components to only two different polyhedra, a 12 sided and a 14 sided module? Um, was there any other options considered? It was benchmarked against other options. But the good thing about the design, and that maybe is also a lesson, that because the structure, the cladding, the space was all part of the same system, you couldn't all of a sudden say, hey, let's just put a square column grid in there because it would have destroyed everything. Okay. You couldn't all of a sudden say, hey, is there a more efficient facade cladding with square panels? Because then it wouldn't have matched the structure anymore. So the lesson is if you design all components, all components of your building in a way that they become a necessity, then nobody can take anything away. So this building really, you couldn't take anything away. You couldn't add anything. It just was what it was. Mm. And that made it really strong. And otherwise, it wouldn't have survived, uh, you know, the economic ups and downs uh, of a commercial reality. Right. Our next question concerns the relationship of the, of the water cube to your work after both at PTW and eventually as the founder and director at Lava. Can you share us uh, with the genealogy of the design of the water cube? Are there projects which had led to the water cube as earlier prototypes, which you had developed or at PTW or in research work or teaching? <clears throat> so maybe this is the moment where I um, show a couple of other projects. You can see my screen, I assume. Yeah. And so I won't go into detail, but there's, there's um, a series of projects that we developed from small to big that came out of these sort of research ideas of membranes, of coral structures, of minimal surfaces, of this relationship between nature and technology. You know, mm -hmm. we're looking into coral reefs, into mangroves, into rainforests as examples for eco uh, ecosystems, spider webs as examples for lightweight structures. Uh, 
And so we developed a series of projects that kind of um, developed from very humble, small pavilions and art installations into entire kind of city master plans. And they all come out of a similar thinking, um, but they don't necessarily have the water cube uh, pattern or geometry. They kind of more come out of this idea, how can we develop for each typology the next step in this typology? So what would an office look like in the future? What would uh, a house look like in the future? How would a city look in the future? Um, and how can the city, for example, become more nature-like um, as a more kind of human environment? The the building that I'm in at the moment, actually here, maybe that's interesting in, in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, you know, residential towers all around the world are square boxes. Uh, and just because it's sort of simple to organize them, simple to build them, et cetera. And so the master plan for this complex city garden was to, uh, to have a series of towers that are kind of like water drops within a landscape park. And uh, all of a sudden, you have a completely different relationship of building to nature, to the people. So these are the respective renderings, 2007. Uh, and this is the kind of completed buildings. And all of a sudden, you have this softness. You have big openings. You have big sliding windows, big balconies, uh, views. And it's not necessarily more difficult to build or more expensive to build. It's just a little bit more effort and you have like an incredible new um, experience. So you see everything else is square and kind of, yeah, normal. And all of a sudden these six towers are like a futuristic mass colony in the middle of Ho Chi Minh City. Okay. So that may be an example how how these sort of things um, can be translated into other Typologies. Yeah. This is also yeah. a project in Vietnam where we, the project is an entire city block, and we kind of break down the city block into these kind of hills and terrace sort of landscapes. Yeah. Soften the um, yeah, soften the, the street appearance, but also uh, liquefy the internal experience moving through this. And maybe lastly, here this was a master plan for an. Uh, peninsula in Sydney, Australia, um, on the harbor and creating like a new residential district based on these kind of mountain-like buildings um, that create like a, a soft environmental kind of ecosystem of relationships rather than square boxes. So I always, um, when I do lava lectures, I always end with this slide that I see the architect as kind of this explorer between the natural world and and the now, the 21st century. So kind of looking at, at old principles of nature, of history, of everything that exists, but then kind of finding within that something new and uh, someone immersive and something um, pointing towards the future. And uh, when you look at things that are happening at the moment around the world, you know, mm -hmm. you get the city of the future under construction in Saudi Arabia, which is kind of the latest thinking about, you know, controversial, I know, but uh, the latest thinking around what a city could be like in the future. And all of a sudden you get this con convergence of this kind of video game aesthetic um, and architecture. And it's interesting how it's always full of nature and uh, this kind of fantasy-like worlds, kind of upside-down forests, avatar-like. And you always get this kind of cyber experience um, where you combine nature with technology. And, um, and now you have the emergence of AI, which I'm sure you are dealing with at university, where all of a sudden you type in city of the future and you get an image like that you know, which otherwise would have taken you five years to design yourself. And these mm -hmm. images just come out of nowhere. And uh, and that always puts you into this interesting conversation 
of where do we stand as the architects within all that you know? yeah like will we still exist as architects or will we be replaced by the cyborg uh, half sloth half uh, robot um, that comes out of ai yeah <laughs> Uh, so beyond the envelope series that of presentations and interviews is set uh, within a master of uh, architecture course here at NYIT and with it the student of architecture public series of lectures and events and therefore your audience is uh, predominantly students as future architects. In this context, can you please share with us from your point of view any advice you may have for this next generation of architects? But the only advice I can give is um, along the lines of this image here, diving in the ocean. So you're diving mm -hmm. in the ocean of architecture surrounded by history and designing the future. And you have to find within that what the future is that you want to live in. And you want to be stimulated, you want to be surprised, uh, you want to see familiar things, you want to see new things. And um, one thing is for sure, the future is going to be different from the past. 20 years ago, someone said to me <clears throat> that this, um, <clears throat> so this acceleration of technology is coming, where more inventions will be made in the next 20 years than in the entire history of humankind. And I'm like, come on, like, how is that possible? Think about electric light, the steam train, how can you surpass this, right? And this was before iPhone, was the beginning of internet before 3D printing, certainly before artificial intelligence. And now, even within the last year uh, with chat GPT and mid-journey, our life has been turned upside down. So you can only imagine what's yet to come. Yeah. <laughs> so that's your job um, as, as architect and designers and creatives to really um, understand the society that we live in and build and design and, and envision the, the equivalent of that for your built and, and virtual environment. And so that's why I think it's so, so important to, to say that if you want to be contemporary, you have to express the now in your architecture. Like look at history for inspiration by all means, but design from now onwards. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for your in-depth presentation and for the great opportunity to interview this evening. Thank you. My great privilege. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Chris. This has been great. I really thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. Uh, and thank you for the generosity to, to join us for the interview. Thanks, Tom. I think we're we're still recording.